as I said, we're going through a series talking about evil. This comes from a series of verses in Ephesians chapter 2 that says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And in this passage, we read about three sources of evil. There's the world, which is evil on the outside, that's all around us. Then there's the flesh, the evil that's on the inside of us, that comes from within. And then we have the devil himself, a person that embodies sin and evil, who's against us. And so we are taking a look at each of these things and seeing how they fit into our world and into our faith. But 1 John 4, 4 reminds us, you dear children are from God and you've overcome them, that is the evil, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When we're overcoming, it doesn't mean necessarily that we're protected from sin and the results of sin. It doesn't mean that we're immune to sin because, because we, we have it inside of us. We have it in the people around us. We have it in this world that we live in. And it's going to touch our lives in ways that's going to hurt us and even in ways where our sin is going to hurt other people. We live in that kind of world. We live in a world where our sin and the sin in this world goes against God's will and God's ways. But we know that the source of goodness and the source of righteousness comes from God. And if God is within us, and we're going to take a look at this today, then we have a source to turn to so that evil doesn't overtake us. Last week we talked about the ways of the world, the evil that's in the world, and that there's evil ideas and evil deeds and evil systems that are at work out there in the world. Why does this happen? Because people have sin. And when people have sin and they act upon it, then it creates more and more ripples effect of sin in our world that we, that we live in. Next week, we're going to take a look at the devil. But today, we're going to look at the evil that's inside each and every one of us, the thing that the Bible calls the flesh. Not necessarily our muscles and our skin, but our flesh, the fleshly nature that lives with inside of us. And you may say, well, I don't feel like I have evil inside of me because evil is things like that are satanic and terrorism and abuse and all these terrible things that we categorize as purely evil. But yet evil is everything that is sinful, that is against God. And if we're honest with it, some of it is inside of us as well. You know how it is when um, our neighbor's dog is barking all the time and it really bothers us, right? But if our own dog's barking, we don't notice it as much. And that's kind of the way sin is. We don't really notice our own sin as much as we notice everybody else's around us. And so, um, so that tends to be a problem. And we need to look inside of ourselves and see that there is evil inside of us by definition and design. Uh, I read a quote um, that relates to this dog right here as well. When it comes to sin, okay, sin sometimes becomes like a pet. The quote says, now that it, sin, is in the house, don't buy it a collar and a leash and give it a sweet name. Don't admit sin is harmless, even though it might be unhousebroken. Instead, confess it as an evil offense and put it out, even if you love it. You can't domesticate sin by welcoming, wel by welcoming it into your home. And I think that that little thinking about the whole pet idea, and we have our little pet sins, things that... We feel like we can hold on to, even though it goes against God, even though it might hurt other people, and ultimately sin hurts ourselves. And so when we talk about our flesh, you know, we don't want to make it a little pet, but we want, to, we want to keep it outside. But yet we're stuck with it. So what do we do about it? And when we have that, we have this struggle inside of us between the, the bad that's inside of us and the good that we want to have inside of it. God knows who we are. He knows from head to toe that there is sin inside of me. He knows I'm weak, and he knows there's not a whole lot I can do to deal with that sin that's inside of me. The trouble is, 
It's hard for me to admit that I'm a sinner. I see it in other people, but it's hard to find it within ourselves. But when we look at our own sin, when we focus upon ourselves, then we get our eyes off of all the other people that we're secretly judging out there, and we can take a look at ourselves and see that we are weak and helpless to be able to take care of it ourselves. I'm not a lifeguard, but I'm told that lifeguards are trained that when they see somebody that's in trouble out in the water, that to rescue them when they're frantically flapping all around and going out of control is actually dangerous for the lifeguard themselves to bring that person in. Actually, if the lifeguard waits a few lingering seconds until the person gives up and feels like they can do nothing more to save themselves, that's the best time to rescue a person out of the water because then they will submit to the swimming of the lifeguard. And that, that illustration is kind of the way it is with sin. If we're flapping around trying to deal with it all ourselves, then we can't let God come along and deal with it in the way that he said he wants to deal with it. The Apostle Paul writes about the struggle that we have with the flesh. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And a lot of times it's, we kind of look at it as like the little, you know, the devil's on one shoulder and the angel's on the other shoulder. And we got this little voice going back and forth inside our head. Um, but the problem is with this battle, the struggle between the spirit and the flesh, if we want to call it like that, that the Bible says, is that, um, is that there's two things. We can't fix our own flesh with our flesh. And God never promised that he would fix our flesh. These are two truths about our flesh that we often overlook or we don't totally understand. We often think we can just fix it ourselves. If we just try harder, then I'll deal with this flesh issue inside of me. Or when we get to our end of our rope on that, then we just say, God, please, just take it away from me. Just take that away from me. And so many of our prayers have been like that. But God never in his word tells us that he is going to fix our flesh. Our flesh is our flesh. And it's going to be with us as long as we live here on earth. And so, but what do we do about it? If we can't fix it ourselves and God's not going to fix our flesh, then what are we going to do about it? You know, fixing our flesh, it's kind of like when you start mopping the floor and you got the bucket full of clean water, and after a little while, the water becomes dirty. And you're using that dirty water to clean new parts of the floor. We can't do that. Fixing our flesh is kind of like that. In Romans 7, 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul says, in this classic description of the struggle, he says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep doing. We could probably all relate to that. You know, the bad stuff just creeps up over and over again. You know, but the good stuff we want to do, that's so much harder to do. And we often feel like we're losing. About a century ago, there was a Chinese pastor named Watchman Nee that wrote a classic book that's called The Normal Christian Life. And in one part of the book, he talks about the tension that Christians feel with this struggle that they have with their flesh. And so, he describes it like this, and I'm going to quote it from the book. He says, the Christian begins to question his experience. He asks himself, did I really know God? Yes, I did. And did I really give myself to God? Yes, I did. Then have I just withdrawn my, my dedication to God? No. Then what's the matter with me now? For the more that this man tries to do the will of God, the more he fails. And ultimately, this person comes to the conclusion that he never really loved God's will at all. And so he prays for the desires as well as the power to do it. He confesses his disobedience, and he promises never to disobey again. But scarcely has he got up from his knees when he falls once more. Before he reaches the power of victory, he is conscious of his own defeat. Then he says to himself, 
Well, perhaps my last decision was not definite enough. Well, this time I will even be more absolutely definite. And so he brings all his willpower to bear on the situation, only to find greater defeat than ever awaited him the next time he has a choice to be made. And then he reaches a point of desperation. Maybe you can kind of relate to that. You know, I'll try harder. I must not have been serious about it as I am now. And we go to God and we try to fix and fix and fix our flesh. So when it doesn't work, then we beg God. God, please take it away from me. But nowhere in the Bible has he said he's ever going to fix our flesh. He never says he's going to take away the temptations. He said he's never going to take away our desire to sin. He's never going to take away our potential to sin. God is not going to fix it. But instead of fixing us, he offers us something even better. I really wish we could just come to church and leave the new model. Okay? The new and improved version of ourselves. It doesn't exactly work that way. And some of you are looking at me like, I didn't expect to hear this today. Okay? This is depressing and this kind of goes against what it's kind of all about, isn't it? So let's look into something that God does promise us. He promises us something better than fixing us. He gives us something that's even better than being fixed. And that is the personal relationship with God. That relationship with him that allows us to believe that he has given to us the greatest gift of all. And that's himself in the form of the third person of the Trinity that we call the Holy Spirit. When we confess our sins and believe that my attempts to forgive myself and to earn salvation are futile, but Jesus has done it for me on the cross. And when we accept that into our lives, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if God lives inside of us, does God want us to sin? Does God want us to be able to find victory over sin? He does. And we have that source inside of us that helps us when those temptations come, when those desires come that go against God's will. The Holy Spirit isn't going to come in, come in and fix us, but it's going to give us a power that's greater than even the power of the sin that's inside of us. Let's dig into this a little bit more. That's where we're going here. It's kind of like we decide what kind of clothes we're going to put on. Are we going to wear our old shabby clothes that are represented by the flesh? Or are we going to put on the clothes of the Spirit and walk in those as we go through each day? This week, your assignment is read Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Okay? 6, 7, and 8. These three chapters deal with this kind of from beginning to end in such a beautiful, wonderful way. And it's full of God's promises about how we deal with our flesh. And many of the verses we're talking about today are from those chapters, 6, 7, and 8. So read those. Even read them every day. Just read them over and over several days in a row so that it sinks in even more. But, in, um, but there are three things that God does to help us. The first one is that there is no condemnation for our sin. I'm sorry, did I skip something here? Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, let's just move on here. Okay, we're here now. Um, there's no condemnation for our sin. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The first thing is, when we see the sin inside of us, when we have those temptations that come that want to overtake us, the first thing we do is name it for what it is. Those sins do no longer condemn us anymore. Those sins have already been condemned back upon the cross. Jesus Christ already took care of those sins. And so those sins no longer define us. Even though they're still in us, they no longer define us. We have a new identity. And so we can claim the truth that our sins have been dealt with. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment for each of those sins that pop up over and over and over and over and over again. And when he took it upon himself, upon the cross, they were dealt with once and for all. And God gave us something instead. He gave us mercy. 
He said, no longer are we going to have to pay for the crimes of our sins. No longer are we going to have to be responsible for the, 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 the offense towards God for what we have done. And he gives us something better. He gives us something grace. He gives us something we never deserved. And so when sin is at our doorstep, we have a chance to say, wait a minute. Even though it's right here in front of me, that sin was nailed upon Jesus centuries ago. And Jesus took care of that right there. That's the first step that we take in overcoming the sin inside of us. And the Holy Spirit reminds us. We're told that that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to remind us about Jesus. And so when we're facing those temptations, we're reminded of what that sin really is nailed to the cross. The second thing is Christ made it possible to live by the Spirit and not the flesh. In Romans 8, 3 and 4, it goes on to say, But God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And there's lots of commas and it kind of goes on there, lots of phrases there. But basically... What this is saying is that, what I was just saying, that Jesus himself, the Son of God, he was the sin offering. We no longer have a sin offering that we have to provide to receive that forgiveness. Jesus was that offering himself. And that sin has been condemned in the flesh. In his flesh. Jesus had a body. His flesh was not sinful. But he took upon our sinful flesh upon himself. So that when we live according to the flesh, that has already been there. And now we can live according to the spirit of God. If there are people who don't have the Holy Spirit, they can still choose to be good. But they're making that of their own willpower. Not because God is helping them. It's like we have this extra help. Within us with the Holy Spirit. When we can't say no. The Holy Spirit helps us to say no. It's so awesome to know that. Even though I am weak. I have somebody that's stronger. I have God himself inside of me. That can help me say yes. To what is right. And to say no to what is wrong. We have an option as Christians. To be able to listen to the Spirit. And rely upon his strength. To help us to say no. And help us do what's right. You know, we, when Christ was on the cross, it wasn't like he was there so he could change us. But he was there to be able to exchange something for us. Life for life. Death for death. He took our death in our flesh upon himself so that when he came back to life, he could give us his life. It's an exchange. It's not a change. And we talk about God changing us. And and to an extent that's true. But the real secret of the Christian life is is an exchanged life. Taking on the life of Christ inside of us. Because we gave him our flesh in the death that it was. And you may be listening to this and say, well, I'm... Okay, maybe this sounds good on paper, but I'm not really sure how it works out in my life. And that gets us to number three here. That we must intentionally and actively set our mind on the spirit and not on the flesh. Romans 8, 6 says, the mind that's governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. When we are setting our minds And thinking about the things that gratify the flesh. Then we're tuning out the spirit of God. And sometimes we do that as Christians. We we take in all these messages that the world's giving us. And we kind of start to believe it. We talked about that last week. About the lies that are out there. that, That start to infiltrate the way we think. And therefore we act upon those things. Instead of what the Holy Spirit's trying to remind us about. And we We shut it out. It's kind of like, I know today you can, with your TVs, you can watch different channels at the same time. 
But with God, you can't really. You're either on your flesh channel or you're on the spirit channel. It flips back, it flips forth. And we have to intentionally commit our days to say that today I want to live by the spirit. I want to listen to the spirit today. And we ask God, God, help me to be in tune with the spirit that my will, that my mind, that my heart, that my affections will be set upon the things that God desires. Because God's going to remind us of all those things as we go through our day. How he reminds us is his own little secret way of doing it. It's that little feeling inside or that little voice we get. Or maybe it comes through other people or other things that come up. And we're like, ah, yeah, God's reminding me. He has, he's very creative in doing that. And each of us have our own little ways that he can turn up the volume a little better in our lives. But we have to be willing to have that volume turned up. We have to say that that's my intentions. God, I know I have this flesh that wants to go against you. But God, I don't want to surrender to the flesh. I want to surrender to the spirit today. Help me to listen to the spirit and rely on the power of the spirit. Because when we do that, then we have life and peace instead of death. When we sin, our sin is an affront to God. It hurts other people and ultimately hurts ourselves. It may not kill us physically, but it kills us spiritually when we give in to the sins that are there around us. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Thessalonians not to quench the spirit. The spirit's like a fire that burns and it tries to just light up the way for us and give us that warmth and everything we need to remind us that God is there. If there's a fire nearby, you know it's there, don't you? It's hard to ignore a fire, whether it's a small little bonfire, whether it's a house on fire, you can't ignore it. A fire is a fire, and that's what the spirit is. But sometimes we just dump cold water on it. Oh, I'm not going to listen to you today. Uh, I'm doing my own thing today. And when we quench the spirit, then we don't have the power to say no to sin. A few weeks ago, I talked about these things that make our spiritual growth, knowledge, faith, character, and action. When we grow in our knowledge of God, it increases our faith in God. As our faith increases, it changes our character from the inside out. And as our character changes, we act differently. We're able to act in the ways that God wants us to. And as we act in God's ways, we get more knowledge through that experience, which increases our faith, which increases our character, which increases our action. And we have this cycle going on in our lives. This is what God is doing in us. This is what the Holy Spirit's doing. Giving us these things that feed off of each other and, and help us to be who God wants us to be. And this is so exciting because when we feel like our flesh is so strong and we feel so weak, you know, that's where we need to be. Because when we're weak, then we can be like that drowning man in the water and rely on Jesus, rely on his spirit that he gives us to show us how to live. And that's how we put it into action. God will not destroy our flesh. That is there. But the flesh has been weakened on the cross. It's been put to death on the cross with Jesus. It's something we don't have to be afraid of. We're not going to be perfect. We're still going to give up to give into it because our flesh is weak and we don't listen to it all the time, to, to the spirit all the time. Not that gives us an excuse, but we need to rely on the spirit more. The next picture is a picture of some branches in our back of our yard there. As you'll notice, some of the branches are just regular branches and some of them are green. And those have been laying there for several weeks. The branches that are green, are those branches dead or alive? Are they dead or alive? <laughs> they're alive, but they're dead. There's nothing growing into them. There's no source of nourishment. They are dying. Okay, and in a way, that's kind of like what our flesh is. You know, there's still some life in it. It looks like it's alive, but if it's not being fed, then it's really useless. That branch eventually is going, those, those pineals are going to turn brown. They're eventually going to die. And God gave us the promise that someday he is going to, in the new resurrection, take away that flesh. We will no longer struggle with sin anymore. But we will be able to know what it is to know the pure walk with the spirit that we strive for here on earth. 
I love this passage from Romans chapter 6. It says, For if we have been united with him, with Jesus, in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's that promise. We will be like him in our resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you can obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. It's right here. Again, he doesn't promise he's going to change us, but he's going to exchange our life. He's going to give us an exchanged life. And that's the beauty. As Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And when we come to the table here today, we're reminded that what we're taking in here, the symbol of Christ's body and his blood, that was for us. And when he was nailed on the cross, our flesh was nailed there as well. And he's given us new life, the life that comes through his body and blood. We remember today, we celebrate today, and it makes us new creatures in him. The old has passed away, the new has come. This is the new covenant of Jesus' flesh and blood in our lives. And so as we deal with our flesh, know that we can have victory. We know that the Holy Spirit is there to give us an exchanged life.